testosterone undecanuate formulations oral pills and intramuscular is this going to be an ester that's safe effective and ethically used and we'll see why this ester of testosterone is definitely not utilized extensively by bodybuilders powerlifters strong men and people looking to use other forms of testosterone esters for muscle building definitely not this is going to be focused on utilizing testosterone undecanate pills and intramuscular formulation for testosterone replacement for men that are hypogonadal The history of testosterone undecanoate goes all the way back to the 1970s where it was introduced to the medical community in China as an intermuscular formulation and then later in Europe as a pill oral formulation. The greatest use though in the world that people are aware of is the utilization of this form in a brand name called Nibido intermuscular formulation in Europe and outside of America. It's amazing that in America, the pharmaceutical companies tried to get a tag in this and tried to get it passed through the FDA for many, many years. And Aved came into the market, intermuscular testosterone undecanoate, in March of 2014 by Endo Pharmaceuticals. It was delayed for years and years as there was a safety issue secondary to anaphylactic reaction, secondary to pulmonary oil microembolisms, and the FDA finally approved it after looking at the safety history at a smaller dose and a just less frequent dosing schedule, 750 milligrams intermuscularly injected every 10 weeks versus one gram intermuscularly injected every 10 to 14 weeks for Nibido outside America. The oral formulation of testosterone on decanoate has been used for years as Andriol in Europe. It was just approved in America March 2019 by the FDA as a brand name Gentenzo by Claris Therapeutics. It's not available in the pharmacies, even as of today, because there was a lawsuit from Lipozine for patent infringement. And I think they won. I think Gentenzo is going to be cleared, and you're going to start to see this pill of testosterone entering the pharmacies in America. And today, this is February 2020. The pharmacology of testosterone on decanoate is in the oral formulation, it's dissolved in oleic acid, castor oil, borage seed oil, and peppermint oil. This makes for a very fast absorption in the GI tract, and it bypasses the first pass effect in the liver as it's uptaken in the small bowel by the lymphatics. It's dosed with food twice a day. The inner muscular formulation, which is so amazing that one orally is super fast, inner muscular formulation is super long. Absolute longest ester in the world for testosterone. It's slowly absorbed from the inner muscular injection only in the glutes. Half-life is 34 days and it's in castor oil. This is amazing that versus the other more classic esters of testosterone, sipinate and enanthate, that are dissolved in cottonseed, linseed, and even grapeseed oils. The approximate half-life is about seven days for these. Safety. The safety issues are very interesting. The oral delivery mechanism of this medicine needs to be distinguished 
from oral anabolic androgenic steroids and that they never make it. This medicine does not make it in the first pass effect into the liver because it's uptaken by the lymphatics out of the small bowel very quickly. So that does make it safe and you would think, doctors would think and people would think that this is an oral anabolic steroid, it's under that classification, so it's going to be dangerous to the liver. It definitely is not. As a matter of fact, there are two studies that I'd like to use to point out. 2013 in the UK and in 2018 in the United States where an oral formulation of testosterone on decanoate was used for treatment of non-alcoholic statohepatitis, otherwise known as the initial stage of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, this is where people have metabolic syndrome and they have liver disease, fat infiltration into their liver secondary to being overweight. 30 million people in the United States, as per the data based on the company that is doing this research. So, is that amazing? that this drug, an oral formulation of testosterone, not only is it orally safe and safe for the liver, it may be used one day <clears throat> to treat a very common liver disease, non-alcoholic statohepatitis. We have to so focus on technology and you really have to focus on aspects of clinical medicine here. Side effects and safety continued for the oral formulation of this medicine. As per the inbox warning for this formulation of oral testosterone, hypertension is a black box warning, in addition to other side effects that we would see with any formulation of testosterone. Headaches, increase in CBC, polycythemia, androgen-induced polycythemia, sleep apnea, and cardiac effects, increasing LDL and lowering HDL. Now, my feeling is that apart from the hypertension, I think this utilization and this type of testosterone, ester, probably is going to be the same as far as safety with any other formulations. Taking testosterone injections, sipinate or nanthate, propanate, you definitely can get hypertension. So I think the studies they presented to the Fed in America <clears throat> showed hypertension, and the other studies that were so done so long ago for enanthate and sipinate, they, they, the Fed just didn't see or notice or were aware of hypertension. But if they did it today, you'd see hypertension along with all the other aspects. So, so far, oral formulation, I think is safe so far. One amazing piece that they come up with is that the increased DHT levels that are derived secondary to the oral formulation are higher and they don't compare to sipinate or enanthate, but they mention in the literature that I read carefully that they're higher. Now, could that end up being better for mood and libido? It could be. That's DHT is certainly one of the end target uh, androgens that stimulate the central nervous system, not to mention the muscles, and why men feel good. This is why it's used. Now, it's not gonna be good for hair, absolutely, maybe not even good for acne because acne is going to be an interplay of stimulating the sebaceum to produce acne vulgaris. It's not just estrogen, guys. It's going to be an interplay of androgens, testosterone in the end, and DHT. No question. And there's so much genetics involved in this. But one of the interesting safety concerns, I would think, is an expert in testosterone replacement for men, is that increased DHT level systemically, is it going to affect the prostate? BPH and also worsening prostate cancer if a man has a malignancy when he starts testosterone. This is what we know today. But the literature says that the DHT that's derived systemically from this oral formulation does not increase DHT in the prostate. Now, I want to get more discussion on this. I want PhDs in pharmacology and other experts in the world to explain this more to me and to you and to all of us, is this going to be a concern in the future? Can the brain feel better because DHT levels are up? We know that's potential and also potentially some mood problems from too much DHT, but this is going to be man per man. But will it worsen BPH enlarging a prostate or causing 
worsening prostate cancer if a man has it. We have to think about this. Safety concerns for the intermuscular formulation. Right up front is going to be pulmonary micro oil embolism and anaphylactic reaction. This is why the Fed in America held up the approval for so long. Now, when you look at other anabolic steroids, let's think about TREN, but even small injections of testosterone. Men have this coughing pulmonary response. Is it from the benzyl alcohol? Because I'm assuming there's a lot of benzyl alcohol that's in this intermuscular formulation. So we don't know. And if you look at what happened in the studies, the attention to detail of exactly where and how this delivered intermuscularly is so important. It has to be in the glute. It's 750 milligrams to in America and a gram in Europe. You can't put that much. I believe it's three mils. You can't put that much in your deltoid or the vastus lateralis. It has to go into the glute. So think about it. How can you really make sure you're, you're really aspirating first with that type of intermuscular administration and the safety of that and the technical ability of the person giving it? This is why it's stated that it has to be done in a doctor's office. You have to be observed after every injection for the side effects. Absolutely amazing. So this is, again, in the future why for guys that want to do it at home and do it more regularly, it's safe with the smaller intermediate acting esters versus this, which cannot really be given by a man himself, although I'm sure men will do it, but needs to be the limitation is in a doctor's office and observed for those side effects. Now, the key to the safety of intermuscular with all the other aspects from hair loss, mood changes, CBC issues, polycythemia, coronary artery disease, sleep apnea, prostate. In my opinion, it's going to be the same. I think what's missing here is that looking at formulations of shorter acting esters, sipinate and enanthate, versus this very long acting ester is the free testosterone. When they presented their data for effectivity, they showed it on a scale of total testosterone, not free. We know that one of the reasons why men feel so much better on small doses, microdosing, if you will, of testosterone esters, sipinate and anthate, is because the free portion goes just up higher, just slightly elevated compared to the total. That's it. We don't see the data is not talked about. No doctors are talking about that. That's going to be the difference you're going to see across the board for the free beyond this potential anaphylactic delivery and effectivity. Let's go into that. Right off the bat, you're going to see that is it effective? Do, do men mind taking injections themselves for men that don't want that? This is going to be a great alternative to them, having it done every 10 weeks in America and in Europe every 12 weeks, for example. There is a slight difference. They call it seasonal in Europe. The difference will be, in my opinion, that because we don't know this in America because it's so new and people really haven't been using it, I think that will change. That the free testosterone with this long-acting ester is not going to go up because of the castor oil, because of the, the pharmacodynamics. It's not going to liberate like it does quickly and launch off regularly like we do with the other esters. And with those small esters, that's why men feel great. So that's the difference is the free testosterone. No question, I look at labs. I've been doing it for years. Always seeing a disparity between the total and the free. Of course, the sex wound binding glomerulin is involved here. So it's going to be interesting. Does this long ester push down sex wound binding globin like it does we see with a shorter acting ester? That's to be seen and discussed. The effectivity of the oral formulation is too new for us to discuss, but I think apart from the dosing schedule, that you have to take this twice a day with fatty foods and the cost. A lot of people can't take medicine once a day, they forget. Imagine, imagine you have to take a medicine twice a day. That's going to affect this medicine and the future use. And of course, until it's generic, there's going to be some cost. But for some men, this definitely will be a great alternative. It's another great tool in our bag for offering men testosterone. 
And again, the free testosterone levels, we just don't have any data on that, on the oral formulation versus we know the intermediate acting esters that are higher. And definitely, in my opinion, why men feel better. And you can control it. Now, those DHT levels with the oral formulation, could this be a game changer for men that feel better with just higher DHT levels, apart from worsening hair, acne, and the prostate? We just don't know. Last piece is there is an ethical consideration. If you look at the inbox warning, it says contraindicated for women, children, and adolescents. There is evolving literature and a consensus in America, and I'm sure abroad, that testosterone esters, and this is going to be a big one for this, for transgender um, women to men are going to be used. So we don't know. And I'm presenting this, just simply presenting this as an ethical consideration that we don't have any long-term outcome data on giving women long-term androgens. We have to be very careful with this, I think, because we don't have data. And this is going to happen in the future, so we're going to see uh, what's going to happen to these people using uh, esters of both sipinate and nanthate and this long-term um, type ester on someone's health uh, over the course of decades. So thank you so much. I really hope this video helps men in the world that are interested in seeing another alternative form of testosterone delivery.